Hi guys, it is a blissfully cool and dark Sunday, September 29th, 2013. Here in the formerly drought plagued wasteland of South Austin, Texas, my Sunday rocky pulpit, Doomsday Rock, is thankfully underwater right now, so I'm here under the Doomsday Bodai tree bringing you my regular scheduled Sunday doomsday sermon where every every week the old doomsday preacher ham on little tail shares with you his latest favorite Bible of the apocalypse that I have managed to dig up at the Austin Public Library and this week as I introduced this book two weeks ago I believe we're going to read from the end of the world the science and ethics of human extinction and this is actually written by a professor of philosophy a fellow named John Leslie I am completely unaware of who this guy is so he, he's a philosopher I believe that he calls himself a physicist in somewhere in this book so I don't know if the man is a physicist and a philosopher or just a philosopher but anyway guys uh, I, I need to put a disclaimer about my favorite Bible of the Apocalypse actually this is a good book and if you're interested in the subject of human extinction Obviously, you should read this, but uh, I am a dumb hippie now sitting in a chair, and it's got way too many of these uh, big old 50 cent, if not five dollar words. You, you know, whether they're physicists or philosophers, when they try to write a book, hey, you know, guy, you know what I'm talking about. Your eyes just roll back in your head. If you're a regular reader, particularly if you're a journalist like this dumb hippie is, uh, anyway, the, I, I, I just can't stand it when the vocabulary and the highfalutin writing style get in, turn, get in the way of the message. So I'm not going to recommend this Bible of the Apocalypse to people averse to uh, five dollar words but that's certainly not to say that there's nothing worth reading in here so what I am going to do uh, is just share as I do every week some of the passages that I found interesting that weren't too guilty of uh, uh, of his highfalutin philosopher style and uh, so what he does, obviously, the, he breaks this down into the science and the ethics. So I'm going to stick to the first half of the book, which uh, is the science of human extinction. And he makes it clear, guys, over and over again, which I guess I should have read his disclaimer, this is a book about human extinction. So this is not a look at things that will take the population of this planet from its present day 7 billion to 1 billion or less. He's not concerned. If, if, if one person is left behind, it, it, it doesn't fit his thesis. It's not human extinction. And he's also not investigating, well very much, is not the central thesis of his book about the extinctions of every other no earthling we share this planet with. That is not his concern here. His concern is looking at the myriad ways that we could drive ourselves from seven billion to zero. I personally do not believe, perhaps naively, as I've talked about in a couple of rants this week, that uh, I, I do not believe that humanity is going extinct and uh, as I'll get to the end of the rant what this fellow believes our chances are but anyway along the ride he did bring up some points and this is just his laundry list 
uh, he has two or three chapters just going through the laundry list. In this chapter and the next, so many risks are listed that it could seem surprising that the human race has survived so long. Uh, on the other hand, it may well be that the risk of extinction has so far been fairly low. What then needs to be feared is a sudden increase in various dangers. And this chapter expands points uh, about well-known risks. Uh, the continued career of the human race is endangered by chemical, biological, and nuclear war, by destruction of the ozone layer, by the greenhouse effect overheating the planet, uh, by desertification, by pollution of land and sea, by loss of biodiversity, by diseases, and don't forget, my favorite, overpopulation, a main cause of the deterioration of the environment may also lead to global warfare. And uh, so anyway, in this list, he just goes down the, the, you know, the usual suspects. We've got nuclear bombs. And then what he does, you know, he breaks down what is the real danger of humans going extinct by nuclear bombs. Here's chemical and biological warfare. We've been hearing a little bit about that. Um, let's see, we have pollution by chemicals or nuclear radiation. Uh, we have destruction of the ozone layer. We have the greenhouse effect, uh, which was just ramping up. This book was written in the mid-90s. We have the runaway uh, greenhouse disaster. We have exhaustion of food producing land and water. Uh, we have loss of biodiversity. And finally on page 71 where I'm going to pause for a while, the population crisis. So this is what John Leslie uh, in the end of the world talks about overpopulation bringing our population from 7 billion to zero. These are some of his thoughts which I will share with you since of course anyone who knows me knows what I think <coughs> is the number one threat <coughs> to this planet. Okay, at least in the near future, a population of as little as 10 billion people could be expected to cause des desertification and famines, intolerable local water scarcities and levels of pollution, which virtually, with virtually guaranteed wars, can you say resource wars. Uh, he talks about uh, the Rwanda war being a war of overpopulation. Despite advances in crop science, we're going to talk about GMOs in a minute here, despite those advances, global population growth seems almost sure, almost sure to outstrip growth in food production in the next 40 years, which in this case would be about, call it 2040, uh, disease and environmental disaster might then sweep over the planet. Species could become extinct in such numbers that the biosphere could collapse or the greenhouse effect might run beyond all possible control. Bear in mind that methane, a powerful greenhouse gas, is generated plentifully by rice paddies and livestock and that many in the developing world 
might like to own automobiles. All this gives plausibility to the title 10 years to save the world, which was from 1992. Yeah, uh, the population bomb is sometimes said to have exploded already. Ordinary, ordinary wars. <laughs> ordinary wars seem unlikely to alter matters by much, meaning as a means of population control. All the fighting from the start of the First World War to the end of the Second World War killed only about one-fifth of one billion people. However, if some desperately hungry or thirsty country unleashed biological warfare, then that might indeed make quite a difference, you know, in, in uh, bringing our numbers down. When one third world bureaucrat was asked what he would like to see from his window 20 years in the future, his answer was, quote, smog. One can sympathize with this. Better the smog of industrialization than grinding poverty and constant fear of starvation. Yet the pollution which causes smog could cause famine also. Even when not pushed by population increase, industrial production tends to grow exponentially as people seek higher standards of living. The combination of an exploding world population, a widespread demand for equalization of living standard, and delays in reacting while the limits to growth approach could easily be disastrous. Overpopulation, environmental degradation, disease, crimi criminality, and war all tend to come in a single package. You cannot separate these, uh, all of these dots. They are completely interrelated. As R.D. Kaplan writes to his fellow Americans, and then he quotes this excellent uh, passage from a fellow named R.D. Kaplan. I've heard of this guy, so I'm going to let uh, John Leslie turn over the doomsday pulpit to R.D. Kaplan, who wrote, uh, quote, For a while, the media will continue to ascribe riots and other violent upheavals abroad, mainly to ethnic and religious conflicts. But as these conflicts multiply, and I don't know what year this was written, uh, about 15 years ago, I guess. As these conflicts multiply going into the 21st century, it will become apparent that something else is afoot here, making more and more places ungovernable. Mention the environment or diminishing natural resources in foreign po policy circles and you meet a brick wall of skepticism and boredom. There you go. People don't want to hear it. If you want to get a, find a conversation stopper uh, at your next little uh, chit chat cocktail party, just mention the environment or diminishing natural resources and see how many people at the next uh, cocktail party you're at flee. All right. To conservatives 
especially, the very terms about the environment or limits to growth seem flaky. It is time to understand the environment, that flaky, boring term, the environment, for what it is. It is the national security issue of the early 21st century. The number one, I would say, global security uh, issue of the early 21st century. <clears throat> the political and strategic impact of surging populations, spreading disease, deforestation and soil erosion, water depletion, air pollution, rising sea levels in critical overcrowded regions like the Nile Delta in Bangladesh will be the core foreign political challenges. While a minority of the human population would be, as uh, one, one of these doom and gloomers uh, would put it, sufficiently sheltered so as to enter a post-historical realm in which the environment has been mastered and ethnic animosities quelled by bourgeois prosperity. An increasingly large number of people will be stuck in history, living in shanty towns where attempts to rise above poverty, cultural dysfunction, and ethnic strife will be doomed by a lack of water to drink, soil to till, and spaces to survive in. There you go. Thank you, R. Kaplan. And then he continues on his laundry list of things that could kill us all. We got naturally occurring diseases. Let's don't forget that comet or asteroid strike as which the last one, Comet Ison, uh, now bearing down on us. Let's don't forget supernova, galactic center outburst, solar flares, black hole explosions, black hole mergers, and next on the list, between uh, black holes and computer calls disasters, we have uh, one of these terms that was just cropping up back in 1996 when this book was written, Genetic Engineering. So what does uh, what does John Leslie uh, see in his crystal ball about genetic engineering 17 years ago? Okay, <clears throat> quite apart from its possible contributions to biological warfare, uh, genetic engineering might be considered extremely dangerous. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. <clears throat> the fact is that the complexity of the field of genetic engineering makes its risk very hard to evaluate, at least in public in the mid-1990s. Most experts say eh, there, are no there are no great calls for concern as shown by both calm scientific reading and the absence of any disaster so far without actually being ill-informed or irrational however you might think the risk and as great as any other which humankind now faces and the apparent consensus among the experts that, that it's not a threat, uh, might perhaps itself 
be explicable, explicable more by social pressures than by scientific findings. Instead of just affecting industry, uh, attempted restrictions on genetic engineering also threatened the salaries and research grants of scientists in universities and research laboratories. The outcome, it has sometimes been suggested, was a speedy presentation of a united front despite quite a severe lack of evidence about the safety uh, of GMOs, which you better believe have, have ramped up since those words were written in 1996. Okay, continuing on. So what really is evident is that techniques for creating dramatically beneficial organisms could also be used for creating harmful ones. The world is well supplied both with criminals and with honest folks who make mistakes. Uh, let's see. True, there will be scores of cases where artificially engineered organisms will do poorly in the wild. Yet there are bound to be other cases in which organisms, uh, varieties of wheat perhaps, which have been given nitrogen fixing nodules, will do better than their natural counterparts. Okay, jumping to the end of this, well, jumping to the bottom line of his crystal ball. So what major dangers might be lurking here? It is almost impossible to tell. Now this itself magnifies whatever dangers there are, for it makes it very hard to set up restrictions which won't immediately be broken. Being humans like the rest of us, genetic engineers are rather easily convinced that their own projects are vital to human progress. Besides, theirs is a field where huge amounts of money are now being invested, but as Wheel and McNally note that, quote, the insurance industry in the U.S. has been unwilling to provide insurance coverage against the event of mishaps in the field trials of recombinant microbes. So if you don't want to listen to these uh, doom and gloomers on the Alex Jones channel, maybe you want to listen to the insurance industry. All right, from there we have computer cause disasters, computer replacements of humans. Don't forget a disaster caused by nanotechnology. And then he goes into one of my, uh, one of my favorites, chaos and catastrophe theory. So I'm gonna read a little bit about what he has to say about chaos and catastrophe theory, which is, you know, how any of this could be thrown into uh, in, in, into absolute chaos. I'm going to read just two paragraphs. <clears throat> okay. For, for us idiots, little dumbass uh, journalism, he, journalism uh, graduates, he's trying to put this in language that maybe us dumb hippies can un understand. All right. A popular instance of a catastrophe is the collapse of a sand pile. For those of you trying to understand catastrophe theory, think of a sand pile. If sand grains are added one by one to such a pile, sudden avalanches 
will eventually occur. You know, the straw that broke the camel's back, whatever you want to call it. Okay, with cleaned, with clean sand piling up on a small plate, the size of the avalanches can be effectively unpredictable. Also, that a system's complexity can itself force it to evolve to more and more complex states which are increasingly unstable until the equivalent of an avalanche occurs as uh, this global industrial society and all of this shit from genetic engineering to God knows what all gets more and more complex so does the uh, so does the likelihood of a completely unpredictable avalanche. So he's quoting some other researchers back in Chen. Uh, right, that systems as large and complicated as the Earth's crust, the stock market, and the ecosystem, meaning the ecosystem of this planet, can break down not only under the force of a mighty blow, but also at the drop of a pin. Large interactive systems perpetually organize themselves into a critical state in which a minor event starts a chain reaction that can lead to a catastrophe. So uh, in the example of the Earth's crust, that would be an earthquake. Uh, as far as the planet's ecosystem, who knows what it's going to be, guys. So much of this, uh, you know, trying to, uh, you know, just by the very nature of chaos theory and uh, collapse theory and all of this, much of this involves bold world modeling with computer systems or very clean sand, if you're following that analogy, which can behave rather differently from natural systems and ordinary dirty sand. And clearly it is no excuse for scattering pesticides everywhere to reduce biodiversity or for destroying as many complex animals as possible. All right, uh, blah, blah, blah. Again, and again, the fossil record tells of complicated species which have become extinct while simple ones have continued onwards. As he said, it may therefore be that cockroaches will outlast humans. There you go. Uh, how many of these uh, other mass extinctions have cockroaches gone right on through? Okay, from there he keeps on his laundry list. Here we have upsetting a metastable vacuum. There you go. Wrap your head around that one. That goes on for, good God, 20 pages. I skipped over those. Let's don't forget igniting the planet's atmosphere by creating cork matters, matter, there you go, and, that's a, and as long as we're at it, guys, his final one on is, why don't we just create uh, an entirely new Big Bang? What about producing a whole new world-destroying Big Bang by mistake? While this, too, is a risk uh, we may well find hard to take seriously and might still seem worth discussing, which is how that brings him uh, to the end of his analysis. And so he finally gets to judging the risks. 
This chapter makes a rough attempt to say which are the most dangerous threats to the human race. Uh, okay. So he goes through how all of these damn things into judging risk. I like this one uh, about uh, where risks largely neglected in this book. Okay, uh, then he goes, uh, since this is the only place he ever touched on this, this is all he says, this is all he has to comment on when I'm talking about the shallow end of the doomsday prophecy pool. He, he gives it one half of one paragraph in a 300 page book. All right. Uh, la, 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 la. So how much danger is there of a worldwide economic collapse caused by the U.S. government, commercial, and household debt twice the size of each year's gross national product? Might human extinction actually spring from something like that or from stock market trading in derivative securities. All of this trading, most of it unregulated. Guys, this was written 12 years, 12 years before the 2008 uh, crash, looking ahead at possible collapses of derivative securities. This trading, most of it unregulated, has an annual volume approaching the combined gross national products of the U.S., Europe, and Japan. So that, as one guy P. Wallach reports, observers have begun to worry that a major misstep could vaporize financial markets. How about that for some doomsday prophecy? But of course, you know, what he says about this, as, as I have uh, said uh, all over and over again about this shallow end of the uh, doomsday uh, prophecy pool. He says it will, that it very well uh, could and probably will unleash all of this shit, which is going to be hell to live through, but it's not going to be big enough to take the number of humans down to zero which is why he doesn't spend much time. Okay, guys, we are finally getting to the end of the science end of this, uh, where I'm going to end this, because I am not even going in uh, to all of the philosophical aspects of why prolong human history. You can read this for yourself. Uh, it just it just really goes into some gobbledygook that lost me. Uh, but anyway, what is his final word, the bottom line, on uh, what John Leslie thinks about the chance of total human extinction? Okay, drum roll please. I feel inclined to say that the probability of the human race avoiding extinction for the next five centuries is encouragingly high, perhaps as high as 70%. So we have, according to this man who has studied the question a lot longer than I have, we have a 70% chance of avoiding total extinction. So I guess he's saying we have about a 30% chance of going extinct uh, sometime in the next five centuries. 30% chance is what this man is saying. And also that if it did so, if the human race does go extinct, then it would be likely either to continue onwards, I'm sorry, if it avoids, if we manage to avoid extinction in the next 500 years, it would be likely the human race would either continue onwards for many thousands of centuries or else be replaced by something better. There you go. 
still it is extremely hard to be sure. Mere expressions of confidence in the resilience of human beings, the cleverness of scientists, the wisdom of our elected representatives, yeah, all strike me as sickeningly glib. Although the imminent extinction of humankind is the constant theme of crackpots, it might conceivably be very likely. And there you go. That brings me to uh, the, the end of my rant uh, from this Bible of the Apocalypse, the end of the world, the science and ethics of human extinction by philosopher John Leslie. And if you want to go on to the second half of this book, which I am not going to bore you with, although I did read it, to read of the philosophical considerations of whether human extinction would be a good thing. And now, for the record, he, he strongly believes it would not be a good thing. He is, he is no way championing human extinction, but of course, as he continues saying, he is only, this whole book is written from the human perspective, and so he is not asking the question uh, scientifically or uh, philosophically whether the extinction of the human race would be good for every single other earthling we share the planet with. You know my answer to that question, but I will have to find uh, the answer to that in future Bibles of the Apocalypse. For this one, this is your old Preacher Hambone from his doomsday big trash chair under the bowtie tree saying Bye, guys.